Ignorance is bliss. This is a saying that has persisted throughout human history, and while it's been worded a number of different ways, the expression stays the same. Not knowing something, or at least pretending not to know something, can lead to a happier, or at least a perceived, more fortunate life. As while knowledge is a gift that can better equip us to deal with life's hardships, it can also lead us down a path of greater suffering. As once we receive knowledge, it changes our perspective on things forever. This is the mindset that was adopted by the quiet and quick, qualified quixotic queen, quashing quarried quambles, Guan Qi, the first devil hunter. Now this video contains spoilers for Chainsaw Man Part 1 up to the final arc of the manga, so if you want to avoid spoilers, you have been warned. Quan Chi is a private practice devil hunter who mostly works out of China, but was originally part of Japan's own Public Safety Devil Hunter Committee, and it's there that she earned the title of the first devil hunter. Her appearance in the main story is actually to play the role of a major antagonist during the International Assassin's arc, but also returned during the final arc of Chainsaw Man in a more minor role. Though Fujimoto has sprinkled some details about her into the main series to make it clear that she has a long history with a few major players in the overall story story, as well as having her be the mouthpiece for one of the main talking points of the themes of Chainsaw Man, this being the idea of ignorance is bliss. Though before we get too deep into that, let's understand the meaning behind her name and design. Now, Quan Shi's name is rather difficult to dissect, as the name itself was written entirely in simplified Japanese, meaning the characters that make up the name have no real meaning to it. Though I believe the name was selected in reference to a concept found in Chinese culture, and I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation of it, Guan Shi, which is harmonious with Quan Shi. Now, Guan Shi is a bit of a complex idea, but to simplify it to my best knowledge, it's a system of social networking and exchanging of favors between individuals where both sides are expected to repay the other for their service, and in some cases, these favors can be valued above the law. Now, Quan Shi represents the idea of Guan Shi in her work life, as she takes on jobs given to her by her government and is paid by them in the form of favors. These favors are in turn paid to her girlfriends, who all are repaying Quan Shi with their service as fiends and their affection towards her. Her character is an endless flowing web of favors, essentially. Now, design wise, Quan Shi seems to take inspiration from Fujimoto's own previous work, this of course being Fire Punch and the Eye Patched Bitch. She's, she's never given a name. She's a character who makes a debut in chapter 29 of the manga, and they resemble each other not only physically, the key details being the eye patch, but they also fulfill a similar role in the story with being an extremely talented individual who speaks a foreign language that is not understood by a majority of the cast, and is fighting not for herself, but the people that she cares about most. Though Quan Shi definitely takes on a more important role in the main story of Chainsaw Man than Bitch did in Fire Punch with Quan Shi even being known as the first devil hunter, which is an interesting title as it can be read in two specific ways. First, of course, is that Quan Shi is the first person to take up the profession of devil hunting, which is a title that we can see partly reflected in her own equipment. Firstly, her weapon of choice, the Chinese Dao, which is one of the four traditional weapons of Chinese history and the grandfather to the more visually famous Dai Dao. This matches up very well with Quan Shi's history as the origin of devil hunting, as she helped teach or grandfather in veterans like Captain Kishibe. Now, the Dao finds itself in a similar position to that of the Machete, where its name even translates essentially to Knife Sword, and this made the weapon easy to acquire and replace, especially during warring times. Because of this, the Dao was the first weapon that soldiers were taught to master, due to it only taking roughly a month to fully get it down. So, this weapon is robust, reliable, and ultimately replaceable. 
It's the perfect hunter's weapon, though it's the inhuman strength of Quan Chi that makes her Daos as deadly as they are, which is represented best in her slaying of 49 men in under a few seconds, which is a scene that is heavily inspired by the Shunji Inomoto one-shot manga Kirasuke and Johnny, The Slaying of 499. We first see it referenced in the title of Chapter 60, Quan Chi and the Fiends 49-Person Massacre, but this extends beyond just a naming reference, as Quan Chi's design is rather similar to that of Kirasuke, mostly in how they both have one eye pronounced at any given time, but also they fight in a similar manner, as both of them use multiple swords during their assaults because the ones that they use grow dull after a certain amount of beheadings. But also, Kirasuke rushes an army while leaving Johnny to pick off those that they don't kill. Quan Shi does a similar thing, even telling her girls in Chinese to clean up after her. They are also both very reserved characters, so they represent each other in personality as well. And the ending of that one shot is very Fujimoto in nature, so I recommend anyone give it a read. Though, even without her weapons, Quan Shi is a very dangerous individual, being able to easily overpower talented fighters like Kishibe and Yoshida, with the latter even commenting that a single hit from her would likely mean death. Also, this fight between Quan Shi and Yoshida itself is a reference to another piece of media, this being the Raid 2 and the fight between the protagonist Rama and the Assassin, one of the main three antagonists of the movie, which also works in two ways, given the arc, as Quan Shi's profession is an assassin and she is one of the three major antagonists of the International Assassin arc, with the other two being Santa Claus and the Three Brothers. Also, funny enough, Fujimoto doing this also went on to help inspire Akatame-sensei of Jujutsu Kaisen fame to use the same scene for one of their fights between Yuji and Chozo. Though, let's return to what got us down this path to begin with her title as the First Devil Hunter, which I mentioned earlier has another way that you could read it, this being the First Devil Hunter, as Quan Chi herself is a hybrid devil, and has assumedly been one for quite a while, given that those around her have noticeably aged while Quan Chi remains the same. And being a hybrid has also likely contributed to her usefulness as a devil hunter, giving her time to hone her skills and being able to survive otherwise fatal attacks given that she can regenerate via the consumption of blood. But, if her prey becomes too much for her human body, she can easily release the arrow buried within her eye and transform into her more powerful devil form. Now, the devil hybrid that Quan Shi is, is never actually mentioned directly in the story of part one. Though, through context clues and design influences, I believe it's very easy to assume that she is either the archery devil or the crossbow devil. Though, given that she doesn't actually have an official name, I'm gonna pitch forth the toxophilite devil, because that's a cool word, and don't lie, you didn't know it existed until I said it just then. Now, design-wise, Quan Shi's devil form is fucking rad. Her neck becomes this collar of arrows, that all stick out of it like her body is one massive quiver. Her head, like most devils in Chainsaw Man, take inspiration from the Guana transformations in Tsutomu Nihei's Abara, which Fujimoto has said is one of the major influences for the whole of Chainsaw Man. Though, in the case of Quan Shi, she has a massive bow mixed in there with her head. Though, one of the most standout details is the three massive arrows sticking out of her head vertically, which match the arrow that was pulled from her eye socket, but also the ones that she launches from her arms. Speaking of which, her arms have now changed into this twisting spiral of muscles that end as bowstrings for this bow-shaped appendage that now appears on her wrist. And part of this bow also has arrowheads sticking out as if they were primed, likely to be launched out like a crossbow, hence why she often gets labeled as the crossbow devil. It also helps that during a period of time, the crossbow was seen as an unholy monstrous weapon that the Pope labeled as deathly and hateful, calling for them to be banned worldwide and that the use of them was crime enough to earn you a spot in hell. So you can say that the crossbow has an inherent fear built into it that could lean to its devil gaining a lot of strength really fast. So it's more likely than not that Quan Shi is the crossbow devil. Now, her devil form, while obviously being inspired by Ibarra, is also in direct reference to another manga, this being Hideyuki Tanaka's Claymore, and more specifically the character Aisley, who has an awakened form that is this massive centaur with the ability to create weapons at need. One of these weapons is a similar bow on arm design. Though one key difference between Aisley and Quan Chi is that Aisley's bow arm is clearly a traditional bow as he has to manually wind it back and loose the arrows himself. 
where Quan Shi doesn't seem to need to draw or loose her arrows. Instead, they launch out automatically, functioning, again, like a crossbow. Or honestly, a ballista, given the amount of force that these things are packing, as the arrows that are loosed by Quan Shi leave these gaping holes in her targets, killing almost anything upon first contact. She can also fire a multitude of shots that shred a target much like a shotgun blast. Along with this, firing these arrows makes no sound, making them the perfect silent killer as well, and it's likely why she became so well known. She is extremely talented in her abilities, and she can appear invisible even to the trained eye. The only way that you can deal with her is if you lure her out, and you can do this by abusing one of her only weaknesses, her girlfriends. As even though she might make it seem like she's uncaring and cold, in reality she loves them very much. Not only taking on dangerous missions in order to secure them human rights, but also regretfully embracing them in death, even when they're converted into killer puppets that are trying to kill her. Though the four fiends that Quan Chi is dating also help represent her personality and her character quite well. So let's go over all four of them real quick. Starting first with the only girl in Quan Chi's harem without a proper name, only ever being referred to by a subtitle given to her in a popularity poll. This being Sugi Hagi or Patchworks. Now Patchworks, judging by her design, is either the Patchwork or Stitches Fiend, drawing their power from the fear of or the uncomfortable feeling you get when you look at a suture-based body modification such as having a body part sewn shut. Though we don't actually know what her ability was, it can be assumed that it had something to do with stitching things given all the stitchings that cover their body. Though, because their body is wired shut, this places most of their ability to communicate through expressions and their eyes, which is seemingly done to match up with Quan Chi's own kudere nature. As she isn't emotionless, she just doesn't have the energy to express herself physically. Next we have Long, one of the more simple-minded of the group. Her name is seemingly in reference to the Chinese word for dragon, which is made pretty clear given that she herself is supposed to be the dragon fiend, and draws her power from the fear of the mythical lizard all over the world, which is still somewhat powerful as dragons, especially in China, can be tied to natural disasters such as the famous Hong, the Rainbow Dragon. Long represents dragon's origins both in her looks, having razor sharp teeth and long spiky horns that stick out the top of her head, which are actually very similar to some Asian dragons, but also has similar abilities to dragons such as thick durable skin and superhuman strength, and of course she can breathe fire. And Long best represents Quan Chi's talent, as dragons are perceived as these ancient powerful beings who dwarf all others with their skills and knowledge. In a way, Quan Chi has become synonymous with the mythical dragon. She's known around the world as the first devil hunter. She also hasn't aged a day since, given how dragons are these ageless beings it matches up very well there as well. And Quan Chi's harem could be a reference to the famous habit of dragons, which is hoarding, as they tend to find valuables and keep them to themselves. And it seems that Quan Chi isn't against expanding her own group of girlfriends. Then next we have Pin Sui, one of Quan Chi's closest partners. She is a younger looking woman with a childlike wonderment and obsession with information, which relates to the meaning of her name, Pin Sui, which is a term in Chinese for sharing stories or talking a lot, even if the information you're sharing isn't entirely all necessary, which is demonstrated best in her conversations with Quan Chi throughout her arc, where she shares facts about things even if Quan Chi isn't all that interested in them. And while we don't know what her devil power was exactly, it seems to tie into the ability of gathering information, as she can peer through a hole created in her hair like a magnifying glass and read something about a person or thing. It's seen best when she uses on Kishibe and sees both his contracted devils and his body's offerings. She is also easily distracted by this pursuit of knowledge, which can be a hindrance to her at times. Now her design is actually rather interesting. It's partly inspired by the Japanese yokai called the Futakuchi Yuna, or the Two-Mouth Woman, with Pen Shui even originally being identified in the popularity poll as Futakuchi. And we can even see her eat with her second mouth during their time at the conveyor belt sushi shop. Though Pen Shui's second mouth, which takes the form of an eel-like appendage, is seemingly in reference to a Chinese myth called the eel hair, which comes from a story of a farmer who uncovers a coffin in a lake after a plague had come through his village, and when he opened it up, inside was a corpse whose hair had turned into swamp eels. 
and this led many to believe that those who die and are washed away into the lake would have their hair turned to eels. Now, Pen Shui doesn't really represent an element that Quan Shi has, she more so represents what she lacks. Being this chatty person of endless curiosity, she is a reliable source for Quan Shi, being able to gather information for her, along with being someone who is strictly loyal to her but can be a voice of reason. And then finally, we have the last of Quan Shi's harem, Cosmo, who might be the most interesting of the four. Cosmo is the Cosmos Fiend and is a representation of the fear of the cosmos or the universe. Be it astrophobia or cosmicophobia, her main ability takes the form of a psychological attack, which actually represents her fear quite well. Now, she does this by actively unleashing an unrelenting flow of information, either by talking to her targets or by forcing them into her mind palace. The way she does the latter is by mimicking the famous Kamehameha wave from Dragon Ball. Now, the inside of her mind palace takes the form of an endless library filled with an infinite number of books, all varying in length and content, which make up every piece of knowledge in the known and unknown universe. And once inside the library of Cosmo, you will have all of this information flow directly into your mind, resulting in you instantaneously understanding everything all at once, but overloading your brain to an immeasurable amount, resulting in you only ever being able to think and talk about the holiday. Halloween. Now, this ability seems to have a few references built into it, so let's discuss them. Firstly, the design of Cosmos's Mind Palace. It seems to be in direct reference to the Library of Babel by Jorge Luis Borges, a short story whose purpose is to represent the entire universe, or the cosmos, as a vast library containing every possible variation of a 410-page book that uses all 28 basic characters in the English lexicon. Now, these books are all organized in random order throughout the infinitely expanding library, though because this contains every possible combination of these characters, a lot of the books within the library are just utter gibberish, hence why he used the term Babel. Though, it also contains all knowledge ever written and ever to be written, but even with every possible book available to you, given that they are arranged in a random order and there's so many of them, this this library might as well contain zero books, as any information that you seek out would be buried and rendered indistinguishable from every other possible form of that information, including every false interpretation of it. Though, why would absorbing all information in the universe cause you to only think about Halloween? Well, I actually have a personal theory as to why Fujimoto chose Halloween over all other words, and it actually relates to a similar power found in Gigi Akatame's Jujutsu Kaisen, this being Satoru Gojo's Unlimited Void ability, where, similar to Cosmos' own Full Force Halloween, Gojo can flood a person's mind with all the information in the universe, overwhelming them to the point of total paralysis. And the chapter after that ability debuts, the villain group of Jujutsu Kaisen starts formulating a plan as how to seal away Satoru Gojo, and they decide on the date October 31st, otherwise known as Halloween. Now, Akatame and Fujimoto seem to enjoy each other's work quite a lot, and have commented about reading each other's work, so I believe Cosmos' own obsession with Halloween might be a complicated reference to Gojo from Jujutsu Kaisen. Now, Cosmos' design represents her overflowing information ability quite well, with her brain literally expanding to the point that it broke free from the right side of her head and even popped her right eye out of socket, which is actually the same eye that Quan Shi is missing, but don't worry, Cosmos can control it. She just doesn't do it often. She also speaks entirely in the word Halloween, but it's possible that in doing so, she lets a little bit of her own infinite knowledge leak out with every utterance of the word, as those she talks to using it tend to end up mimicking her, in the same way that all of Santa Claus's dolls end up saying Halloween after she has her mind utterly broken. Now, while Long and Patchwork represent Quan Shi herself, Cosmo and Ping Sui, they both represent the antithesis of Quan Shi's mindset. They are beings who are enraptured by knowledge and the pursuit of it, while Quan Shi understands the danger of information and strives to live a life of ignorance. The news. There's this reporter on the morning news who's my type. I watch that program every day. I'd even buy the magazine she was in. Things like that. One day, she was exposed for lying about her age. After that, 
It was like the floodgates opened. Exposés on her ex-boyfriends and bad behavior aired on TV, one after another. She kept appearing on the morning news regardless. But I stopped watching that program. It wasn't that the reporter had changed. It was my brain that changed. The secret to leading a happy life in this world is that ignorance is bliss. Quan Chi is someone who resembles a possible future for Denji as a character. A person who lives their life in ignorance and claims that this mindset is the key to happiness, which is an element of the story throughout this arc. From the small moments, such as when Quan Chi's dining out with her girls and has the mood partly soured by information that she learns while she's eating, to Aldo, one of the three brothers, learning more about his new identity's old life and feeling guilty for ruining it, to bigger issues like how Sam Santa Claus gained vast knowledge of darkness but couldn't comprehend how Denji worked and ultimately lost because of that. We also see that the pursuit of knowledge and gaining information has only led to suffering during this arc, while on the opposite end, those who stayed ignorant of the truth benefited from it. Again, in the small moments, such power hits one of the triplets with her car. She pretended to be in the know, but was completely ignorant to the whole situation. Then, of course, we have when Quan Shi told Denji to believe that the dolls weren't actually alive so that he could kill them without regrets. Or how Denji's single-minded desire and a hard life made all of Santa Claus's strategies and taunting worthless. We even see that Kishibe takes his old buddy's advice to heart, when he refuses to see the fate that she is dealt after she confronts Makima, wishing to remain blissfully ignorant to the subject. And after this, Denji would go on to live his life in almost endless ignorance to most things around him. Though is Quan Shi's point of view correct? Is ignorance truly bliss? Well, according to Chainsaw Man, it's more complicated than that, as living a life of nothing but ignorance is not a good way to live, as after a while you begin to lose your identity and your sense of self. Knowledge is a key part of what makes us who we are, and while it can be harmful to the person you are now when you receive it, it can help shape you into a better person later on. Along with this, our everyday life is filled with a constant flow of information. You can't remain ignorant forever. Eventually, you will become informed, and if your only defense against hardship is your ignorance, your stumble might become more of a fall. Part of Denji's entire character is experiencing this firsthand, ultimately becoming a tool with no sense of self, but it was his experience out of ignorance that helped him choose to become the person he is by the end of the story. He followed the path that he wanted, and he got to be a little selfish. He wasn't ignorant of what's worth fighting for anymore, and it became clear to him that the key to happiness in this world is not the pursuit of knowledge or living in blissful ignorance, but finding that perfect balance in between. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to see more videos like it in the future, I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash guy. And if you want to sort of loosen your blissful ignorance yourself, you can do so by buying a copy of Shimonetta, A Boring World with Constant Dirty Jokes Doesn't Exist at buyshimonetta.com.